grateful I am that according to the law of attraction, we had the consciousness to attract her as our speaker today. So welcome, Christiane. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you very much for this very, very warm welcome. And I would like to dedicate this talk to my father. My dad is going to turn 77 on the 24th of March, and I am very lucky and fortunate that I get to celebrate with him in Germany because I'm leaving tomorrow. And so this is actually a huge big deal for me. And as I was preparing myself for the speech right now, I actually threw everything that I was going to talk about out of the window, which Mary just emphasized again by, I have the choice right now, and I'm choosing to choose something a little bit differently than I had originally planned. What I just remembered was when I was listening to the music and in the first service that we had earlier, that my father has a very, very special story. He actually, and I, I feel this, there is a need to share that story with you because there is a lot of explanation why I have such great love for America and why I ended up here as an immigrant 25 years ago, which is now half of my life. And I realized that there is a huge connection that we have with America. Even when my father was a very small child, he was born on Easter Sunday. And so he must have been six years old when the war ended. And he actually was out there in the street with everybody else we waving the American flag as the tanks came rolling through our little tiny town called Flörsheim am Main, which is between Mainz, Wiesbaden and Frankfurt, for those of you who know German a little bit. And so the people are standing out there, the soldiers are marching through town, they are driving through town on their tanks, and there was a tank that stopped right in front of, of my father's house that he was born in. The hatch came open, and there was a black gentleman. There was the first black person that had my, my father had ever seen in his life. The soldier smiled at my father, he reached out his hand, and he gave my father an orange. That was the first orange that my father had ever seen in his life. And that was a huge gift for him. And I really believe that this experience went deep, deep into his heart and created that incredible relationship that he has with America. And he's a biker. He loves to ride his bicycle. He bikes over five, 6,000 kilometers a year, or he used to before his knees got a little bit um, damaged. And so that is one of the things that I remember as a child, that he would pick up stray bikers. He would pick up people who get lost, and he would show up with two, three people for lunch on Sunday, like, hey, Mutti, let's go and uh, cook food for these people. And they, broke ver they spoke very broken English because they were not really educated in their high school days. And so my sister and I, we got to be the translators. And there, there has always been this really close and loving relationship with the country of America and our family. So lo and behold, my parents are over here in an RV, literally, touring Utah when I meet my husband, Sean, in Germany on the weekend, literally. This is the weekend we are celebrating right now, 30 years that I've known my husband. So that is wow. <laughs> And uh, what makes this so incredibly special is that my parents, just coming back from the USA, hey, we had such a great time in America. Good to know, because this is my American boyfriend. Welcome. <laughs> that was really good timing, I'd say. And they welcomed him like a son. They immediately gave him a room. My father visited the barracks. He's like, you're not going to sleep in that. So my husband actually started living with us. He would go to base on his bike. I mean, there's a lot of history and a lot of amazing beautiful correlations that I have with this country and lo and behold here I end up a few years later in Utah and we've spent here 25 years and it's been just a magnificent blessing for my own life as well as for my children. We are now in Kanab for the last five years and that's just been absolutely awesome. So why do I dedicate this to my father? There's a second part to that. My father wanted to walk the El Camino. That is for him as a Christian a very, very big goal that he's now not able to do anymore. So actually my sister and I, we dedicated ourselves last May to do that. And in October, my sister and I are going to fly to that little town we're going to start out. We're doing the first 130 miles. Now understand, I'm a couch potato. I don't walk, okay? So this is a huge deal for me to dedicate myself. I'm going to work at least 13 miles a day for 10 days straight with all my stuff on my back. So this is for my father. 
And I have chosen my father as my topic for today in conjunction with what we're talking about with vulnerability, which is the theme for this month and what you guys are studying and what you're learning in your personal evolution. The idea of putting ourselves out there, of not being afraid to show our feelings, to be taking those risks, to be authentic, and even if there might be rejection, even if there might be judgment of criticism, to still do what we need to do, what we know, what we believe in, those steps that are sometimes so hard. And I talked with some of you outside first, after the first service, who thanked me and said, you know, thank you so much for re-emphasizing. And you know what? I have done this many times. So part of my intent in today's speech is to really remind you guys how many times you have been vulnerable and how it's been working for you well. And by being able to take that risk, by being able to step into that vulnerability, what you might have gotten out of it. So let me share a story with you that ha happened exactly two years ago. I don't know if you guys remembered that there was this terrible airplane crash that we had in Germany that then actually happened to be a person committing suicide and that was the co-pilot who actually drove the airplane into the side of the mountain. I was in China when that news reached me. I saw it in the morning in my Yahoo popping up when I opened my email. Of course, I was immediately very distraught, called my family, we were Skyping back and forth, and it happened on my father's birthday. It was his 75th birthday. My whole family had prepared for the event for months. The whole house was full. It was gonna be a very big, joyous celebration. Instead, it turned into a major mourning for the whole country. And I was very connected with my parents during that time. And what touched me the most was that there was a school class of children. And that's where I can tell, you know, the emotions come up because my son was 16 years old at that time. So I was really relating with those parents who are sending their kids on a trip. This is our, you know, big graduation trip for these kids. They go into Spain to study Spanish and... Yeah, and then everything turned out very differently. So I was very touched with that, and it definitely infiltrated my teaching during that time. I was doing a corporate training, and so I did a lot of processing, and I did some meditation in the evening, and I could feel getting very, very emotional. And I used to not be a crier. That started about 10 years ago when I really started to peel away those pieces of mask of perfection. And I always have to be on it, you know, and people expect me to be on it and da, 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 da. And I can't really show my emotions. That was my perception about how to be a good trainer, you know. I got to be on it and all that stuff to be a good leader. Well, I had a pretty rough night that night. My grandmother came to me in my spirit. She has been gone since I was in my 20s. So she, her presence became very, very, very strong. And it was all that grief that I experienced for that imagining being those parents who are losing their children right now. And so my grandma's energy just became stronger and stronger until I finally realized what I was tapping into is the fact that she lost her child, her second son. After my father was born, she had a second son about three, four years later, Gerhard, who I would like to welcome here and honor here. My uncle Gerhard, who died of starvation when he was half a year old. And while I was processing that, I got into a serious, serious crying fit. I, it was so bad that I literally called my translator. I said, Chucha, would you please come to my room? I'm doing some major processing here. I know I'm dealing with some serious ancestral stuff that I'm healing, that I'm bringing to the forefront. Please, please be here with me. I cannot do this alone. And she literally held me half an hour in a little ball, just bawling my eyes out. And what I said to her later was, I think I cried tears that have been stuck in my family for 70 years, that my grandmother never allowed herself to grieve. When you put yourself in her situation, having a young child, losing her baby, her husband is in Russia, she doesn't know if he's alive, she's working three jobs to feed the family, there's always this fear, this unbelievable hardship of being in a war, I, I can only imagine what she must have been through. And I talked with my father afterwards about it, and he said she never talked about it. So I can only imagine what this woman must have gone through in her grief and not being able to share that with anybody. So that was worked out in my body that night. And then, you know, I never slept that night. Um, getting there, you're looking at the clock, you know, my nose is all red. It turned into a major cold. I got sneezes. I, it was just a crazy experience. And I knew that energetically I had released some major big stuff for my family. The only problem was I had to teach the next morning. So what do you do? Okay, seven o'clock comes around. Okay, time to get up. I had three choices. Either I can just call in sick. I have, the, I have the right to call in sick. I've never done it. 
I was actually contemplating. I was feeling so terrible. How am I going to stand in front of these people for eight hours today and be like, hey, come on, we're graduating. We're having fun. Yeah, yeah. Turn, yeah. No, no, that's not going to happen. Okay, I can call in sick. That would suck. Okay, I'm going to put this on the back burner. I could simply put on the mask. I'm good at that. I can do the mask. I can say, yeah, I got a little cold symptoms and stuff. I'm sorry, I'm, but I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to do my gig as I was going to do it. Or option number three, be authentic. Step in front of these people and tell them what happened. Well, ultimately, after a lot of soul searching, that's what I chose to do. Funny enough, the topic that we had that day was about ancestral timeline healing. So it was about actually helping our ancestors heal and letting go of patterns that we might have adopted from them. So it truly was the perfect example to give these people. What surprised me the most, I made it through the day. It was an awesome day. We got a lot of healing done. I was able to maintain my energy in a high enough level to be able to be of service to my group. And then I slept literally for 12 hours after that, and I was completely exhausted and done. It took me a few more days to really process what had happened that night. And the feedback I got from everybody afterwards was the most overwhelmingly positive feedback I've ever gotten in any class ever. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your journey. Thank you for showing your authentic self. Thank you for not being afraid, blah, 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 and so on and so on. And I was floored because it completely changed my whole perception about perfection and how I have to be and what the mask is and all that kind of stuff. And being able to show your vulnerability, to be able to step out there, to take the risk, to jump off that cliff, to take that quantum leap and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. What's the worst thing that can happen here? Really, when you really think about it, what is the worst thing that could happen right now if I took that leap of faith, if I took that jump? And that's, for example, what we did as a family when we moved to Kanab five years ago. Because it would have been so much easier to say, oh man, we built this lovely life in Salt Lake City. Things are good. There was no crisis or anything that compelled us to go. We just knew we wanted to go. That was my childhood dream. I watched those movies with John Wayne when I was five years old. Seriously, guys. And I remember that moment when I was like, these are not fake backdrops. <laughs> This is real. This is nature and it exists and I had never seen anything like that. And I was compelled and I wanted to be there. So when we moved five years ago, we packed the kids and the cats and the truck, all of our stuff. And we said as a family, what's the worst thing that could happen if the leap of faith that we're taking here right now would not work out? We moved back, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's that easy, literally. So. That's what I would like to share with you today on the level of thinking about how does vulnerability show up in your life? Are you okay with it? Do you allow yourself to be vulnerable? See, I had some really negative connotations about vulnerability and even looking it up in the dictionary, what it really means when you look at the definition of it is to put yourself into harm's way with the, with the possibility of getting hurt. And that is how vulnerability lived in my head. It means verwundbar. You have the ability to get hurt. And that is a very different connotation and actual definition than what I've now put around that container of vulnerability and what it means to me now. So yes, it can be a strength or a weakness depending on how you see it, of how it lives in your mind, in your heart. What is your definition of vulnerability and what does it mean to you? So my invitation to you this morning is to perhaps check it out and see how vulnerability plays out in your life and how you are allowing yourself to be perfect in your imperfection. I love nature. I love to look at trees. So to me, trees are the pure symbolism and plants in general are the pure symbolism of perfection. And if there's something that goes on in the environment where there isn't as much sunshine or there is some kind of an obstruction in the way, what do they do? They grow around it and they make it look beautiful and it is a peaceful process. There's no struggle. I'm going to grow this branch. No, I don't believe that. When I feel the energy of a tree, I feel joy and aliveness, vivaciousness and vitality that just grows naturally, that flows naturally. And that's why I love Taoism, this flow, this idea of just flowing. And that's what vulnerability has allowed me in my life to be more in the flow, to be in the flow with the emotions. When I am working through a major big deal that has been in my family for 70 years, I have the right to be sad. 
and it's not going to lose any credibility or any kind of status or whatever. Now look at her. She's all working through her stuff. I don't want to learn from her anymore. <laughs> but that's what I used to believe, that I'm somehow losing my credibility when I'm letting other people know that I'm working through my stuff. And that's what my coach actually told me a long time ago. She said, Christiana, people don't come to you because you're perfect. People come to you because they see you on your journey as well. And we are all on a journey. Every single one of us is on a journey. And this journey is so unique and awesome and special that each one of us has. And then the real miracle is that all of these journeys come together and congeal into all of us moving on our paths together. Isn't that cool? And then you have a community because you are attracting like-minded people around you who are somehow on a similar path than you are. So this is a very, very safe environment. This is a beautiful environment to practice. How far can you go out of your comfort zone right now to practice your vulnerability? One of my things is crying in public. You know, that was one of those things of showing weakness and whatever. And yet, when I listen to Mary's music, I get so touched, the beauty of the, the chords of her guitar and the words that she says and the, the power of her voice. Man, I was bawling. And it's like, yes, and that's okay because that is so appropriate for right now, for that emotion of gratitude, of overwhelming gratitude that I'm feeling to be in the presence of such beautiful sound. And that is okay. So please allow yourself that okayness to show your emotions, to be in your emotions and to really express them and experience them. So let's do that. Let's anchor that together with a nice little visualization that I'm going to guide you in. And you can choose if you want to open your eyes or have them closed. The important thing is wiggle around a little bit in your chair to just get comfortable. Let go of any kind of little kinks and, you know, stresses that you might have in your body. Breathing deeply. I just invite you to now look at your life as a whole, like if it was a movie, your life story. It might be the book of your life, the novel of your life. And as you're looking across, I know that you have many experiences where you have shown vulnerability in the past. And it was okay. You might have actual memories coming to you right now or you just get this general sense yeah I've done this I have shown vulnerability and I was okay and it was being acknowledged perhaps I was being encouraged and I would like for you to just gather some of those memories and some of those ideas and put them deeply into your heart into your mind so that you always have them available when you need it because I guarantee you there will be experiences because as you're growing, of course you're putting yourself out there. And you will encounter people, circumstances, events that are going to push your buttons, that are going to challenge you. There are opportunities for growth. There are opportunities for transformation. And in that moment, you get to make a choice. And I would like for you to now think about that in that moment, how easily you can have access to all of your resources. That faith, trust, peace, confidence, freedom, choice, gratitude, compassion, forgiveness, and any other resource that is going to help you to just be And to let it be, to be okay with it, to surrender. And knowing that life is going to move on, that you're on your path, that everything is going to be okay. Let all together, just breathe that in. <sighs> That's right. And then when you leave here today, and you're going to see your family members again, your friends, and then you go into the week with your co-workers and your community and anybody you're coming in contact with. You're going to be a model. You're going to be a shining light for others because by you being willing and able to embrace your own vulnerability on a deeper level, and you're expressing that, you are giving permission to others to do this as well. You are giving them the ability to recognize it in themselves, to also claim them within themselves. 
And that's how we can create that beautiful ripple effect that goes out into the community. So just see that, how over time you are part of that beautiful ripple that goes out. And the more you practice it in your own life, the easier it becomes and the easier it becomes for others. So it is and blessed be. That's right. <laughs> Okay, and to anchor all of that in, I would like to ask our practitioners to please come up and hold the space for our prayer. And as Lynn has said, you have some amazingly wonderful resources. These are such beautiful people who hold such an incredible vibration and sometimes when you don't believe in yourself, they will hold that space for you. And I remember how that felt when I didn't believe in myself and others told me you can do it. So please make sure that you reach out to our community, to our practitioners, as we now pray together. Dear Mother and Father God, dear universe, divine creator, the oneness, the quantum field, the Akashic records, Buddha, Allah, Wankatsanka, all the many names you go by, the one that is not nameable, the one that we can only experience, the one that we can know, permeating us, surrounding us, ever present, everlasting. This beautiful energy that manifests itself into the yin and the yang, into the man and the woman, into our beingness. That beautiful energy that flows through us to become a physical manifestation. We are so grateful. We are so grateful to be that catalyst, to be part of that path between the spiritual and the physical. And this is such an act of courage, such an act of trust and faith, and of vulnerability to know that we're in the right place at the right time, connecting with the right people, taking the right actions, thoughts and feelings. I send a special prayer to the oneness for all of the people here in this room today, their loved ones, the children, the family members at home, the friends, the neighbors, the whole community, that together we allow ourselves to step into our own vulnerability, to allow ourselves to take those risks, to make those choices knowing that we are protected, that we are safe, that we are supported and always taken care of. I claim that for this congregation, for all the people in Salt Lake City and beyond, as the truth, as the way it is, it is by our will alone that we send our mind in motion and by declaring it, so it is. As we now take a deep breath together, to anchor it in our body and together we say and so it is thank you very much